Hello, hello everybody. How's everybody doing? Hello. <laughs> Alrighty, we're all logging in. It's busy telling everybody that we are live. We're just going to give everybody just a few minutes just to hop on. If there's somebody you feel needs to be here, if you're new here, welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, it's going to be a fantastic hour. Uh, we're just going to give everybody just a few minutes to log on. Let's have fun together tonight. Um, let's spend time in the Word of God. Uh, I'm excited. <laughs> it's been a, a long couple of hours for me, um, but we're just excited to be in God's presence. So let's give everybody a minute or so. I see there's quite a significant amount of us already here, and we thank God and praise God for that. But again, if there's somebody you have in mind that you feel should be with us, uh, that you feel should be a part of um, Jesus as Jesus that Bible study then please go ahead and uh, tag them and let them know share this as much as you can we appreciate you're going to give them two more minutes and then we are going to kick start in those two minutes I want to encourage you to get your Bible uh, get a Bible uh, get something to drink uh, get a notepad and I see some of you guys have been teasing me on the socials I always say this I love the cute notebooks I really really do think they're cute especially the ones with the little verses on them they're amazing but I do want to encourage you from an economic perspective <laughs> and also just functionality and practicality I want to encourage you to get these thick books right these notepads yep the ones we use at school uh, just think of it like this, if you're studying a subject uh, in varsity or you're in matric in high school, um, you know, the cute little notebooks are not going to work if you're taking notes. Uh, you need a bit of room, you need a bit of space. Um, I don't want you to be shy when you're writing out, so I want to encourage you to, to please get a notebook or use whatever system works for you, quite frankly, um, but something that allows you to freely uh, take notes without considering too much <laughs> and worrying too much alrighty it's Thursday again I just want to check the sound um, if we're good with the sound then we're good to move we're good to move if we're good to the sound I know just one of the team members will let me know um, it's always so weird if I have Bible study somewhere else and then I come back home it's like <laughs> it feels a little bit different Last week, I was with my mom and my grandmother in Cape Town. We were having a grandcation. Uh, it's when uh, you take your grandmother on vacation. <laughs> and your mom comes along. <laughs> Three generations deep. Uh, sound is good. Thanks, Ms. Winnie. I appreciate it. Alrighty, we're going to get into it. Let me quickly just introduce myself to everybody who's new here. My name is Rorosa Ntendekisa. I'm one of the team members here at Jesus This, Jesus That. If it is your first time here, uh, please stand and somebody's going to shake you. No, I'm joking. Uh, we are so glad to have you. We're excited uh, for you to be a part of tonight. And we really do believe that God wouldn't lead you this way unless he has a good word for you uh, that is transformative, that will change your life, that will mean something to you. Um, um, we, we love the idea that we can come together and Bible study together. But what we love more than that is that God is intentional with each and every one of us. There's about 4,000 of us, 5,000 of us now uh, here on this live. And God is intentional about each and every one of the 5,000 that's here. He is incredibly intentional with all of us. So please use this time wisely if it is your first time you are our prayer point we what you are exactly what we've been praying for so we are so glad to have you and of course to our family at large what it does family <laughs> good to be back it's another thursday it's the third one for the year uh we're starting quite <laughs> uh, and we just pray that god will continue to keep the momentum um, and we're just excited about the things that God is doing and the year that we're going to have as a Jesus, this Jesus, that family. And more than us, just as a family, as a community, individually, uh, just what God is going to be doing. I just want us to pause for two seconds. Um, and I get these all the time, but there was just such an influx of them this week. Um, last week, we spent a significant amount of time praying. Uh, we prayed for different kinds of things. And the testimonies and just people sharing what God has been doing is absolutely incredible. From uh, people who didn't have money for fees, 
who all of a sudden out of nowhere God just made a way um, people who were trusting God for healing people who were trusting God for a job uh, people who had anxiety and depression and just felt God lift off the weight um, I even had family members that we were praying with uh, for a family member's uh, healing and um, that family member uh, passed on and I was so nervous. I was like, oh Lord, where am I even going to start? And I was just blown away and just how they were declaring God's goodness and his mercy and that they had seen him even in this time. And, and I just want us to take this time just to thank God. And maybe that's not your case right now, um, but it is hope right that God is indeed moving and he's answering our prayers and he's hearing us and that it's very important for us to stand in the gap for others to continue to pray to continue to have faith to continue that trust to trust that God will make a way we start at the beginning of the year declaring it the year of lilies and birds and if you have not watched that I want to encourage you to go check it out it's basically what we're standing on for this year and that is that we are incapable of worry why because God is with us um, um, then last week we, we looked at the story of Noah and that we need to be righteous until it rains and and that speaks to relationship it speaks to walking with God it speaks to knowing that God has got you what we know about Noah is that not only was he righteous or he was blameless in his generation but the Bible tells us he walked with God right he was 600 years old and God still gave him an incredible mandate for him to fulfill one that would go down in the history books even you and I today are still speaking about that miraculous um, encounter that he had with God. So we want to just encourage you never to lose hope. But Lord, we want to pause and say thank you. Um, if wherever you are, if you're in the car and you're driving home, uh, if you're at work and you're listening on your earphones, if you're watching this a little bit later on, if you're at home in the comfort of your own space, you're watching with your family, you're watching with your friends, I just want us to take two minutes just to thank God that, Lord, we see what you're doing. We see the answered prayers. Thank you. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you tonight, Lord God, for just your faithfulness and your word over us. Thank you, Lord God, that you are a God who answers our prayers. Thank you, Lord God, that we're beginning to see the goodness of the Lord. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Lord God, we just want to stop and just acknowledge your goodness and your mercy over our lives. Lord God, we want to thank you, the great King, and just give you all the glory and the praise, Lord God, that tonight, Lord God, some of us, our, answer, our prayers are still not answered, but some of us, Lord God, you have made a way, you have carved a way for us in the wilderness and in the desert. And Father, we thank you for that. And as a family, Lord God of Jesus, this Jesus, that where we stand together week in, week out, in agreement, in prayer for ourselves and for our friends and families and our communities. Lord God, we want to just acknowledge just how good you've been to us, Lord God. Thank you for the testimonies that are flying in, Lord God. Thank you for the testimonies that we're hearing about, Lord Jesus. And we pray that this is the beginning of just your goodness and your mercy. This is the season, Lord God. We will hear of your goodness. We will hear of your great works. And indeed, they will be marvelous in our sight. Thank you for the gift of testimony. Thank you, Lord God, that we can use our mouths to declare your goodness for the things we've seen you do in our lives. We thank you for those students, Lord God, that you're making a way for. We thank you for those, Lord God, who are not well, that you've answered their prayers and healing is coming. And Mudimwaka, while we added those of us who are still waiting on you, Lord God, who are still trusting on you, renew our strength in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Give us the grace to stand on your word word in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Lord God, we just wanted to come with a heart filled with gratitude to say thank you. Thank you for every student who's got an opportunity to study. Thank you. Thank you for the students who are yet to receive, Lord God, a way through. Thank you. Thank you, Lord God, for the healing. Thank you, Lord God, for the redemption. Thank you, Lord God, for even for those who are yet to receive it. Thank you. We don't take it lightly. That not only do you spend time with us and you, you dwell in our midst and, and you grace us with your presence, but Lord God, even on top of all of that, you love on us and even on top of that, you answer our prayers. Thank you. Thank you. We are grateful. We are grateful. Thank you that you're doing it for our friends. Thank you that you're doing it for our family members. Thank you that you're doing it for Jesus, this Jesus, that members. Thank you that you're doing it for our church members. Thank you that you're doing it for our communities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In the mighty
mighty name of Jesus Christ. We are grateful that we are able to see your goodness. And the devil loves to keep us in a place where we only see what is going wrong. But we, Lord God, want to turn our eyes to everything you have done. Your great mercy and love for us. Thank you. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Alrighty, we're gonna get into it. Okay, so woo! <laughs> you guys said the sound is good, right? Uh, I'm gonna try and leave it alone because I keep adjusting it. So if it's good, then I'm gonna trust what you guys are saying. Father, here's your word. We thank you for it. We thank you that it is a light unto our path. Thank you, Lord God, that your word stays true. Thank you that you watch over your word to perform it. Woo! What a glory <laughs> that you watch over your word, that you guard your word. Thank you that you take your word so seriously. And Father, as we come together in this time to go through your word, to hear your word, we pray that our hearts and our minds will be aligned in Jesus. That we will not be distracted. That this hour will be used effectively. Pray, I pray, Lord God, that you anoint my lips. Let it be you who speaks, Lord God, not my biases, not my opinion, not my life limitations, Lord God, but just your goodness and your mercy displayed in your word. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Bless your word, Lord. Bless your word, Lord. Woo, okay, cool. Well, we're going to get into the word tonight. Akatrela Wodi Dabredeish. So forgive me if I'm a bit not behaving. Um, like I said before we started that um, at the beginning of the year, well, when we came back for Jesus is Jesus, that we, we looked at the year of lilies and birds and that was speaking about not worrying and placing our trust in God and just the anxiety that comes with the beginning of the year, um, the overwhelming feeling, uh, the many declarations that are made, um, the almost like if you're saying it, then hopefully it's going to happen. And we were kind of just establishing that it happens out of relationship, that we, we cannot continue to teach, that you can just call it a year of progress and then have nothing to do with God. <laughs> call it a year of great blessing and you're, you're, not, you're not with the one who blesses. And that we don't function from a place of worry, that we, we, we function like lilies and birds resting in God's promise. The last week I looked at Noah, and, and for me, such a, ooh, I'm still eating from that word, uh, such a profound part of scripture, um, maybe a part that I overlooked or because I had heard the story of Noah so many times, you know, it's those first couple of verses uh, that introduces this part of scripture and, and says that he <laughs> was a righteous man, that he was blameless in a generation that God was about to wipe out, that God stops in his track to preserve Noah, to have a covenant with Noah, even though he has found that entire generation, um, basically he, he's found himself in regret for that generation. Hence, he, he removes that entire generation. Um, it also says that Noah walked with God. And I think this is uh, probably one thing we will forever hear, um, particularly from a Jesus, this Jesus, that perspective that we don't want um, a culture where we pop in and out of God, but we really want to put relationship at the center of it, that it's important that we pursue a relationship with God. Right? That Noah got to do the things he did for God, not because he was a two goody shoes or, or he was 600 years old and he was old and God just like, oh, I felt sorry for him. No, it's because he was righteous that he pursued relationship. He made God a priority. A and that's the message that we want to rest on um, for the rest of the year. That relationship is key right we don't want dependency we don't want you dependent on a jesus this jesus that for you to have an encounter with god we don't want you dependent on anyone dependent on anything it's the word of god it's your relationship with him that ultimately is key i think it was a uh, one of uh, great leaders in the past they were like oh there's so much word that's been put out there that's been taken out of context there's 
false prophets there's all sorts of things where god's word is just being used and 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 to manipulate people to make people do stuff to whatever the case may be i mean it's nothing new it's always been there um you know paul speaks about it he tells timothy to watch out for it so it's nothing new however um i love what the, the, the i can't remember who but what man of god was saying that but he said um but study the word like make sure that you can hear and you can identify when something doesn't align with God's character, doesn't align with God's word, uh, no matter how popular the person is, no matter how great of a person it is, it's important that you get into the word. And it's going to get worse. It's going to get worse. It's going to get worse. So, 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 so get in the word. It's going to get 10 times, 3 times, 100 times worse. Get in the word. Learn to start chewing the word for yourself. Amen. We're looking at a, a famous part of scripture. I feel like I say this every single week, but I'm a lover of the word. So all part of scripture is famous to me and popular. But this one I definitely know is we're looking at Matthew. Okay, we're going to be looking at Matthew 14. It's an infamous part of the story. It's 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 a a side of Jesus that you know kind of gets everybody waiting with bated breath. It's that story that you hear non Christians talk about. Uh, it's the story that Christians use, you know, to kind of like look at our God type of thing. It's a the story that gets most people excited. It's also one that many have tried to reenact. You you'll see if you go on YouTube or anywhere, mang 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 mang, trying to walk on water like Jesus did. So we're going to go to that part of scripture today, um, the part of scripture where Jesus walks on water. Um, and now I know that oftentimes when we part, come to this part of scripture, you know, the, the amazing part of, 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 of the story is gang, 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 gang. You know, Jesus appears and he, he's walking on water. And oftentimes when we hear about this part of scripture, we're told and, 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 and rightfully so that, you know, Peter walks out, but Peter begins to sink because he stops looking at Jesus, right? And that you got to keep your eyes on Jesus and you got to fix your eyes on Jesus. And, and this is all important. And, and I want to reiterate that, 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 that is the truth, right? Keep your eye on the prize, keep your eyes on Christ, fix your eyes on, on Jesus. And it's really a beautiful part of scripture. And I want us tonight to unpack it a little bit more and dig in a little bit more. And I pray that the Holy Spirit begins to show us a little bit more in this part of scripture um and i think it's going to be interesting i do want you to make notes tonight uh there's a lot of scriptural references that i will throw your way i know that the team will probably try and uh, capture it and we'll put it in the stories and of course you can come back and watch this but i really do want you to make notes for yourself um i'll try to i know when i get into it my pace runs away i'm gonna try to be like the khrut money today um, and and take it a, a bit slower because there are quite a lot of uh, scriptural references that we we need uh, to get through and and I really don't want you to miss them so get those pens and and and, and notebooks ready um, we're looking at Matthew fourteen Matthew fourteen if you have your Bibles you can go with me we'll take it from verse twenty two I will make reference to the upper part or the the the, the, the verses before. Uh, verse 22 but I will let you know once we're looking at them but I guess our main focus or context today is coming from Matthew uh, 14 we're taking it from verse 22 the Bible says immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him uh, to the other side while he dismissed the crowd verse 23 after he had dismissed them he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray by himself to pray later that night he was there alone verse 24 and the boat was already a considerable distance from the land drawn by the waves because of the wind that was against it verse 25 shortly before dawn Jesus went out to them walking on the lake verse 26 when the disciples saw him walking on the lake they were terrified they said to themselves, it's a ghost, and they cried out 
in fear. Verse 27, but Jesus immediately said to them, take courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. Verse 28, Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come onto the water. If it's you, tell me to come onto the water. Verse 29, come, Jesus said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. Verse 30, but when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Verse 31, Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him and said to him, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Verse 32, and when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Father, bless the reading of your word. May it be true, undiluted, not biased, Lord God, but biblical. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. So we get to a part of scripture, like I said, that's quite popular. A few things I want you guys to note right from the beginning, which um, just caught me uh, and, 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 I, and I was like, yo, it's probably quite a great place for us to start. Even my notes are hectic today. It's going to be a party. It keeps going. <laughs> it's going to be a party. Uh, but, but, but. I think one of the first things that stand out is even verse 22, right? And oftentimes the first verses are the ones that we quickly go through because we're trying to get to the meat of the scripture. So verse 22 says, Immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side. If you're taking notes, I want you to just write there under verse 22. Jesus' compassion was extended to the disciples. Jesus' compassion was extended to the disciples. He put them first because he knew the type of day they had. Jesus puts them in the boat and tells them to go ahead. He is immediately aware of how long of a day they've had, the, the, the amount of emotional turmoil that they've gone through. He puts them first and he sends them to go and he stays and he dismisses, according to uh, the Bible, the crowd. Still in, in, in Matthew 14, I want you to look at verse 12. Verse 12 is, is John's disciples coming to Jesus to tell him that Jesus has been beheaded. John has been beheaded. Now, these are obviously not the best news to hear. I can imagine the grief that they were stricken by. I can imagine how difficult of a day from that moment, even knowing how John was taken out, even knowing that his head was put on a platter as a display. Uh, and John's disciples come to Jesus after burying his body to come and tell him the news that, 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 that John had been beheaded. In verse 13, you see that Jesus withdraws the group onto a boat to privately find a solitary place. They hear these great grievous news and Jesus immediately withdraws them in a boat to find a solitary place uh, where they could privately be. But the Bible tells us that because of the need and the urgency that was around uh, for Jesus and his word and his healing, that the crowd followed him. The crowd followed them to their place of solitude. The crowd followed them to the space that was meant to be private. The crowd were hungry for God's word. In verse 14, the Bible tells us that Jesus had compassion over them. Jesus had been healing the whole day. He had been doing preaching the word and healing multitudes. They just got the news of John the Baptist, but the Bible tells us that he still had compassion on the crowd, meaning he continued to perform healings. In verse 20 of Matthew 14, we see them feed multitudes. The, the five loaves and the two fish we see them, we see Jesus perform a, a miracle that today we still go and rave on about. Then the Bible tells us that after they had fed this multitude, after they had uh, uh, done this great act, you can imagine how difficult it is to feed 500 people. Just take for a second the logistics of just 
passing food to 5,000 people who are just seated there waiting to hear from Jesus. We can confidently say that at this point that they were tired, they were drained, they had a long day and Jesus puts the disciples first in the boat and releases them and he dismisses the crowd. I want you just to write this and maybe it's a side note and, and maybe it's not for everybody but it's for some, is that Jesus' heart is of a servant. That you and I know that in our generation today, the most important people are the ones that are released first. We live in a VIP society where, where, where the most important person in the room is the one that's ushered out, is the one that's taken through the back door, is the one that's, that's, that's taken to it. But we see that Jesus' compassion is not only for the multitudes who are there to see him, but his compassion is also extended to the ones that serve him. He serves them in that moment. If you read the top part of, of, of chapter 14, you'll realize at some point the disciples were asking Jesus to release these people so that they can go and find food for themselves. And Jesus was like, no, what do we have here that will multiply and feed? As long as they're here, as long as they are with us, they are our responsibility. We can take care of them. See, Jesus understood that as much as the disciples wanted to be there, wanted to serve, that he had a compassion for them that the disciples couldn't quite comprehend they were ready to tell them to go and look for their own food Jesus was asking what is it that we have so we can feed them so Jesus was still compassionate towards the crowd not only did he just come and make miracles or perform miracles and preach a word and disappear he's the one who dismisses the crowd he loves on them till the very end. He, he serves them till the very end. And if you're a leader and you're in this life today, and maybe it speaks to how we lead, is, is, is that are we serving? Ah, it's a story for another day. But what I want to highlight here is just Jesus' servanthood heart. He's willingless to be the last to leave. Woo! The Bible tells us at the night it was him by himself. His willingness to serve. If you're taking notes, we look at verse 23. And after he dismissed the crowd, he went onto the mountainside to pray by himself. The one thing I want you to take note here, if you're taking notes, right there, relationship. <laughs> after hearing of John, after healing the sick, after leading with a servant heart his disciples, after taking care of the multitudes, after feeding 5,000, after dismissing a multitude, Jesus still prioritized his time alone with God. If you're taking notes, this is what I want you to write. That Jesus, oftentimes in the scriptures, in the midst of everything that is taking place, he makes it a priority to stand before God. So after he serves a multitude, after he performs miracles in front of multitudes, after he, he does these great acts that people are probably walking home talking about, that hey, it was five loaves, but it fed 5,000. It was two fish, but it fed 5,000. There was even leftovers. After he's done all these great miraculous things in front of multitudes, the audience of one was still his priority. And maybe the question we must ask ourselves in that moment is the audience of one hour priority. See, he does these things in front of multitudes, but he does not forget the audience of one. The Bible in verse 23 tells us that he goes to a mountainside to pray by himself. 
A lot of us, when we've seen God do great things, when we've done great things for God, when we've lived our best life and best day, uh, a phone call with a friend is probably the first thing we do. Uh, a, a WhatsApp chat with a friend is probably the first thing we do. Hey friend, let's go out for drinks to celebrate this and that is probably the first thing that we do. Jesus acknowledges that, hey, a lot has happened today. Let me let these guys go. But the audience of one is forever my priority. The Bible tells us that he goes with himself to go pray. The things we pray for in private that God does publicly should again be thanked and acknowledged privately. Hope you're hearing me today. The things we trust God for, the things we stand for in faith privately with God, the things we conversate with God, the things we, we tell God, our heart being displayed to God. When God finally answers or does those things, we too should quickly go back to that private space and pour out our gratitude, pour out our heart. I can imagine that Jesus had a lot to say to God that day. He prioritized the audience of one. Let me also say this in the midst of everything. The highs and lows of miracles and teaching the word to hearing the news about John to performing one of the greatest miracles in history till today. The audience of one. We live in a generation that tells us that the more, the merrier. <laughs> the audience of one. Verse 24. And maybe this is a sidebar and I'm sneaking in here. Uh, not so much what we're speaking about tonight, but I just felt that I needed to throw it in there. So just write there in bracket sidebar. Later that night he was alone. The Bible says later that night he was alone. It's a sidebar. We're just passing. Somebody's already caught it. Later that night he was alone. See, crowds followed him the whole day that day. <laughs> His disciples were with him the whole day that day. But the Bible says later that night he was alone. Let me maybe put it like this. That no matter what's happening in life, the order of life is that later you will be alone. There's a point in your life where the audience around you is not there. Where the multitudes have left. Where the crowds have been dismissed. Where your disciples and your clique and your tribe and your spouse and your children are not around you. Later that day, he was alone. You've got to cultivate a relationship with God that's not stimulated by others. You have got to prioritize a relationship with God that is not dependent on another. Sidebar. Okay, they're back to the message. <laughs> Verse 24, the B part of it. The Bible says, and the boat was already considerably a distant from the land that the boat was considerably far out from the land so where Jesus was and where the boat was the Bible says there was a considerable distance between the two Let me put it like this in a way that we can understand. This is what I wrote. There is a considerable amount of evidence and reasons as to why you can't make it in life. There, there are a considerable amount of reasons why that marriage can't work out or that healing be possible or that degree be attainable. There is a considerable amount of reasons and evidence that justify the means to the end that Jesus is far out. The boat is far out. There is a considerable amount of years that you've been sick. 
There, there is a considerable amount of, of years that you've looked for a job. There's a considerable amount of years that you've trusted God for a child. There's a considerable amount of years that you've trusted God for a breakthrough. Trusted God for financial freedom. Trusted God for the things that you've trusted him for. There's a considerable amount of time, distance, space. That gives you all the reasons to say, listen, it cannot work out. You're far out. Jesus is on the land. You are in the middle of the lake, far out. See, what we're not arguing today is the considerable amount of time, space, distance. No. We are aware that you've been sick for a while. We are aware that the marriage is going through trouble. We are aware that the de degree feels like an up here. We're aware that the business is not coming together like you had hoped for it. We understand that there's a considerable amount of time and distance. See, at this point in our lives, I wrote here down, it seems as though the waves of life has pushed us too far out away from Jesus. It seems that we've gone too far for him to reach out for us. It seems that he is, he is, is he is in the distance. I can't no longer see him. Can he possibly see me? The sin that I've committed has covered me. I'm too far out. It's, it's too much that has taken place. God can't possibly be at arm's reach from me. But if you read verse 25, if you're making notes, it says, Then Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. This is what I want you to note if you're taking notes. Woo, thank you, Jesus. No wave or current can push you too far out that God cannot come out to find you. Some of you need to write that in bold and highlight it because the devil has lied to you far too long. When you read that part of scripture, it says that the winds had pushed the boat far out. It was a considerable distance because of the waves and the wind. And I want us to write down that it seems that life's waves has pushed us too far away from Jesus. Write this down. No wave, no current can push us too far out that God cannot come out and find us. Verse 25. I also want you to write this part of scripture down, Romans 8, 31 to 39. Romans 8, 31 to 39. And this part of scripture in your own time, make sure that you read it through. It says, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Come on, we're having Bible study today. Romans 8, 31 to 39. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. The waves and the current cannot. It's, it, they are incapable of pushing you too far out. 1 John 4.19, 1 John 4.19, it speaks about we love because he first loved. See, he first pursued you and I. In your own time, read it, 1 John 4.19, that God first loved us. We love because he first loved. He, he comes out because even before you got on the boat, he was madly in love with you. Even before the winds started moving, he was madly in love with you. Even before the dark came and, and you could no longer see Jesus in the distance, he was madly in love with you. John 3.16 for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. There is no wave, no current that can stop God from pursuing you, chasing after you, loving you, seeking you out. And we want to just pause there for a second. Anybody who's believed that lie over their lives, that God does not love you, that God does not see you, that God is not mindful of you, that is a lie from the pit of hell. The very foundation of our faith, John 3, 16, is an expression of love. That God loved us so much that he gave his one and only son. You are loved. You are, you are, you are sought out after. You are cared for. God loves you. He is madly in love with you. The current and the waves cannot push you too far out to a place where he cannot find you. Woo! 
Thank you, Jesus. Come on, follow with me now. We're on verse 26. The Bible says, when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. They said to himself, it's a ghost. And they cried out in fear for help. Well, we're going to stop a little bit at verse 26 and just digest it quickly together because I feel like it's such a powerful part of this entire part of scripture. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. They said to themselves, it's a ghost, and they cried out to God for help. Maybe before I get into it, let's look at verse 27. Verse 27 says, take courage. This is now Jesus responding to their fear and them thinking he's a ghost. It is I. Don't be afraid. Permit me to submit this tonight. That the concern is not who is walking on water. That the matter at hand is not who is walking on water. That the focus is not who is walking on water. But that there is a state that the disciples find themselves in. See, when Jesus responds, he deals with the state of their heart. He says, take courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. A little later on, he, he, he squeals at, at Peter and says, why did you doubt? You of little faith. See, the issue here is not who is walking on water. The issue here is why are you terrified? Woo! Help me preach this tonight, Lord God. The concern was never about who is walking on water. The concern is about the state of of their heart why are you terrified he speaks to fear he speaks to the fact that there's something that can rattle them in that way he speaks to the fact that you can't surely be scared we just fed 5,000 we've just seen great miracles you've seen me raise the dead you've seen me do all sorts of things why are you terrified it's not who or what is walking on water it's why are you terrified he says, take courage. So he speaks to what state they are meant to be in. He tells them that it's him. Then he says to them, don't be afraid. So get out of the state that you're in. Woo! I hope somebody's hearing me today. He says to them, take courage. That's the state you are meant to be in. He says, it is I. Then he says, don't be afraid. He speaks to the state they are currently in. It's not about who's walking on the water. The question here is, why are you terrified? Why are you terrified? With everything you know, why are you terrified? With everything you've seen me do, why are you terrified? With who you are associated with, why are you terrified? Come on, look at Isaiah 41.10. Isaiah 41.10. Isaiah 41.10. Isaiah 41.10 says, So do not fear, for I am with you. Woo! Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. For I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. Listen to this. He says, I will strengthen and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous hand. Come on, look at Deuteronomy 3 verse 22. Do not be afraid of them. Them that can walk on water. Them that can bring all sorts of things. Them that can sit in your office and conspire against you. Them that can speak ill of you. Them that can lie on you. Do not be afraid of them. The Lord your God, watch himself, will fight for you. See, we are not, not terrified because we are strong. No, don't get it twisted. We're not courageous because we've got it all figured out. No, don't get it twisted. We're not courageous because there's a special anointing that is put aside for some. No, that's not the case. We are courageous because God says to us, God himself will fight for us. So it doesn't matter what is walking towards me on the lake. Bottom line is, God will fight for me. 
Come on, look at Deuteronomy 31 verse 6. Be strong and courageous. Do not fear nor be dread because of them. For it is the Lord your God who goes before you. He will not leave nor forsake you. Why am I courageous? Because God goes before me. See, Jesus told me to get in the boat and cross over to the other side. See, 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 he goes before me. I know for a fact that even if something creeps up in the middle of the night, even if something creeps up somewhere along the job, even if something creeps up along the year during my degree, even if something creeps up along the year in my marriage, in my health, in my finances, is the one thing that I know for sure that gives me the confidence to take courage in any situation is the fact that he goes before me. Come on, look at Isaiah 35. Isaiah 35 verse 4. Isaiah 35 verse 4 says, Say to those with fearful hearts, Be strong, do not fear. Listen to it. Your God will come. Woo! Somebody's just going to highlight that bit. Your God will come. Your God will come. See, even if there's a ghost-like figure coming my way, my God will come. Even if the finances don't look right, my God will come. Even if the body is failing me, my God will come. It says in Isaiah 35 ver uh, verse 4 that your God will come. He will come with vengeance. That's why I tell you all the time, you ain't even got to fight for it. You ain't even got to conspire. You don't even have to have revenge. You don't need a revenge body, a revenge mind, or a revenge plan. You don't need to do none of that because God says he will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. Oh, so good. He will come to save you. It does not matter who or what is walking on the water. I, at every stage, should take courage. Come on, look at Isaiah 41 verse 13. Isaiah 41 verse 13. It says, for I am the Lord your God who takes Ooh, hold of your right hand and says to you, I love God, because he says, I am the Lord your God who takes you by your right hand. And I say to you, this is what God is saying, do not fear, I will help you. So the issue that Jesus has here is not that they can't recognize him. That's not the problem. The issue here is that, 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 that there's a ghost-like figure. That's not the problem. The problem is that they are terrified. Why are you terrified? Take courage. It is I. The same I who will <laughs> hold your right hand and come and rescue you. The same I that goes before you. The same I that will fight for you. The same I that will take vengeance on your behalf. The same I that will save you. It is I. Why are you afraid? Don't be afraid. Why are you afraid? We, we've got to start believing and taking God at his word. Come on, I hope you hear me tonight. We, we've got to start taking God at his word. Let me say it like this. Whatever, whoever, walks towards you on the lake. Whatever life throws at you, whatever weapon is formed and whatever form it may come in, our assurance is that it will never prosper. It will never prosper. Because he goes before me. He fights for me. He comes to save me. We need to take God at his word. We need to take God at his word. It's becoming evident that we don't take him at his word. That's why at every second glitch in our lives, we, we walk away from him. That's why at every second glitch in our lives, we speak badly of him. At every second glitch in our lives, we walk away from faith. We walk away from church. We walk away from good relationships that instill Jesus' principle in us. That's why it's, it's, it's evidence that we have not taken him at his word. At every little thing that goes wrong, we are ready to throw in the 
towel and walk in the opposite direction. Take him at his word. Take him at his word. Verse 28 of Matthew 14. Listen to this. Lord, if it is you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Now, oftentimes this part of scripture, and for a number of reasons, which I definitely understand, when people look at this part of scripture, they think it was a, an exchange between Jesus and Peter in the sense that, you know, uh, prove, prove that it's you. Give me a sign that it's you. Show me that it's really you. If, it is, if it's you, then you tell me to come, you know? Like, Lord, if this is you saying I must do this, let me see five red cars. If it's really you, Lord God, help me. Uh, uh, by the end of today, I will see uh, three pigeons and two chickens. You know, Lord God, if it's really you today, it's like, give me a sign, then I'll move. But, but something struck my heart that when I read this part of scripture, I remembered Luke 5. And that Simon Peter, they were toiling all night trying to fish and catch fish. And this is when Jesus meets his disciples. Toiling and toiling and toiling all night. And Simon Peter says something profound to Jesus. He says, Jesus, we've been toiling all night, but if you say so, we will throw in the nets. Woo! I hope somebody's already hearing me tonight. If you say so, we will throw in the nets. I want to submit tonight that based on Peter and Jesus' relationship, this wasn't a show me a sign and I will come. I believe at this point that Peter understood that if Jesus speaks something into the atmosphere, not only does he hear it, but creation hears it. I'm trying to behave y'all today. Woo! That Peter understood that if Jesus says something, not only does he hear it, but creation hears it. See, when Simon Peter said, we've twirled all night, but if you say so, we'll throw in the net. He understood that, hey, if Jesus said it, then the fish will come. Something we were unable to do throughout the whole night, but because you said it, then surely the fish will come. So, so Peter is saying to Jesus, if it is you, you must tell me to come. Speak your word. Declare your word, because when your word is declared, not only do I hear it, but creation yields. So water that would ordinarily not carry my weight, but because Jesus has spoken, the miracle is not that Jesus and Peter are walking on the water. The miracle is that Jesus spoke and the water complied. Woo! When he says, Jesus, if it is you, speak. You tell me, give me a word to come. Boost my faith. Give me the confidence to walk out. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing of the word of God. So boost my faith up so that I have the confidence to walk out. But while you boost me, creation yields, creation bows, creation hears and obeys your voice. So water that would ordinarily sink me in cannot sink me in because your word has been spoken. It has to comply. It has nothing to do with my faith. The waters are just simply following the instruction and the voice of God. That is the miracle. Shaya kabab. That is the miracle. Peter says, if it really is you, Lord God, call me to come. You tell me to come. Because I know that if you say it, creation, everything in this moment will yield to your voice. I want to submit tonight. That maybe the issue here with Peter and Jesus is not so much anything other than the fact that the Bible tells us in verse 28 that Jesus told him to come. In verse 29. And that Peter ultimately walked on the water. Verse 29. But I want to remind you that in verse 29 it tells us that Peter walked on the water. Then the Bible says he then saw the wind. The Bible says he then saw the wind. I want to remind you of verse 24. Verse 24 says the waves, the B part of verse 24. And they were buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Why did the boat move so far out? Because the winds were against it. 
Peter heard God's voice. He heard Jesus' word. He heard their instruction, but he saw the wind. Maybe let me remind you of Ecclesiastics 1.9. And this is what it says. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. That's Ecclesiastic 1.9. There is nothing new under the sun. Watch this. The wind was always there. I got five minutes. I got to wrap this up. The wind was always there. The wind was always there. The fact that they were far out was because the wind was always there. What am I saying to you tonight? That when they heard Jesus say, get in the boat and go ahead of me, they took Jesus at his word. It was the same Jesus who gives them a word to say to them, take courage, and they took courage. It's the same Jesus who says to Peter, come, and Peter comes. But it's only when he saw the wind, the wind that was always there, See, the devil doesn't come up with new tricks. No, the wind has always been there. The devil can't formulate anything you know. The wind has always been there. He, he's not creative enough. The wind has always been there. What am I saying to you tonight? Ooh. Don't exchange the word for what you see. The wind was always there. He, he wasn't distracted because the water stopped holding him up. No, God had already spoken. Woo! I hope you hear me tonight. He does not begin to sink because the water that's holding him up began to open up. No. He begins to sink because he saw the wind. And maybe we're a lot like Peter, where God has given us a word. But we're looking at the wind, the wind that has always been there. And because we're looking at the wind, we no longer go with the instruction or the word of God. We no longer lean on the word of God. And listen to the interaction that Jesus and Peter have. Jesus then captures him and pulls him by the hand and, and makes sure that he is safe and says to him, Why did you doubt? Not why did you doubt that it's me, the ghost walking on the water. I told you it was never important. Why did you doubt my word? Why did you doubt my word? Why did you doubt the power in my word? Why did you doubt that the water will do what I asked it to do? Why did you doubt my word? You looked at the wind and doubted my word. You looked at the circumstances and doubted my word. You looked at the lack. And for God that I said that every need you have, I will cater for. I am God, your provider. You looked at the sickness and you forgot the word that I told you. That on that cross there is no illness that God did not cover. The wind has always been there. The devil can't come up with anything new. Why are you terrified? Why do you doubt his word? And I want us tonight to look at our own lives and genuinely ask ourselves, what are we terrified of? And why do we believe that God can't complete or oh, that God is incapable of saving us in that situation? What are we terrified of that we believe has more power than God? In closing, verse 32, the Bible says, when Peter and Jesus got back in the boat, the wind died down. The wind died. Long after the wind has blown, Jesus is still there. 
long after the current crisis in your life and the current stress and the current current wind Jesus is still there the Bible says in verse 32, when they got in the boat, the wind died down. It was never about the boat. I mean the wind. <laughs> it was never about the wind. The wind was never the star in the story. The wind didn't even feature in the story. We, we made it feature. Peter made the wind feature by, by looking at it as something that was more powerful than God or Jesus' word. Then this is the question I leave with I leave with you. I'm, I'm out of time. I'm looking at the time. What does the word say? I said in the beginning, we're not going to pretend like the wind is not there. The wind was there, will be there. There's nothing new under the sun. But what does the word say? Rory, I don't have money to go to school. What does the word say? My, my, my family's falling apart. What does the word say I I'm trusting God for my business and my life what does the word say I'm 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 waiting for financial breakthrough what does the word say my body is ill and I've been getting what does the word say and see this is where you and I have the big problem is that we have glorified our problems so much that we actually don't know what the word of God says about the things we're dealing with See, when the Bible says, study the word to show yourself approved to God. It's so that you know what the word says. <laughs> the wind has always been there. But whatever form that the wind will come and try to present itself in, we must land at the most important question what does the word say why did you doubt it's not that you didn't hear the word it's not that you don't know the word it's not that you don't know his power it's not that you don't know that God controls all things why did you doubt the word and maybe some of us are at a point like Peter we know the word and we've doubted the word and some of us don't even know what the word of God says about the situation that we've got because we haven't taken time to search his scripture to hear his voice to sit in his presence to know what it is that God God, you have to say about the situation. There is nothing under the stars that is new. There is nothing in the world that God has not spoken to. What does the word say? And, and you and I have got to be deliberate this year. We've got to stop this mediocre bouncing in and out and, and, and having quick little prayer points and Googling how to get through. No, really spend time in the word. Please pray for me. What scriptures are you standing on already? Let me join my faith in yours. What are you standing on? What did God say that I can join my faith with yours and we can stand on that thing that God said? What does the word of God say about your situation? Come, we've got to get to the point where the wind is no longer an issue. They, it can blow. What's beautiful about the wind is that if you and I stand outside, we can't see the wind. Can somebody tell me the color of wind? The wind was never the star in the story. Why are you terrified? Why did you doubt? I am the God that goes before you. I am the God that will save you. I'm the God that will hold you up. I'm the God that will hold you with my righteous hand. I'm the God that will hold your right hand and help you. I'm the God. Who goes before you? Why are you terrified? What does the word say? Let's pray. Father, we thank you tonight. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your faith. Thank you for your word. <laughs> Woo! We thank you for your word, Lord God. 
We thank you for your word. I don't even think I have any other thing to say. But Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you that you speak. <laughs> thank you that when you speak, creation hears you and obeys. Thank you, Lord God, that there is nothing that we're facing in our lives that you have no word for. Thank you, Lord God, that there's no situations we can find ourselves in that you have not spoken to. Lord God, give us the grace and the will to search your scriptures. The grace to sit in your presence, to hear your voice, to hear what it is you have to say. The winds will no longer shift us from the things that we've heard. In Jesus' name we pray. Hmm.